Have scientists discovered the Higgs boson? If so, what does it mean? Astrophysicist Jeff Swearing breaks it down on Science News Flash. Welcome to Reasons to Believe Science News Flash podcast, a look behind the headlines. This is Joe Aguirre with Dr. Jeff Swearing, UCLA researcher, author of Who's Afraid of the Multiverse, on July 6th, or is it the 7th? Uh, it's the 6th today, Jeff, is that right? It is the 6th. You know, with Jeff. that holiday, we kind of <laughs> <laughs> we're still on holiday. July 6, 2012. All right, Jeff, we've had at least a week of hype and all kinds of headlines, many of them uh, humorous. In fact, you've passed around some jokes even this morning. Let's first find out what was actually discovered, and then we can get to the background implications and even a joke or two, if you like. Right. Well, this is a, you know, a discovery that particle physicists and actually most people in the scientific community had been anticipating. It was just a matter of when would it come out because um, the large or, and it's the discovery of the Higgs boson. And so there are two particle detectors at the LHC, which is a large particle collider in uh, over in the German or France Swiss border. That uh, is most powerful particle particle accelerator accelerates uh, particles with collisions at eight tera electron volts. You know these are uh, you know enormous energies uh, for particle physics, and so you know it was just it was built to detect the Higgs boson. And there are two different particle detectors on this experiment that both independently have the gold standard five sigma detection of the Higgs boson. And so it's important because this is kind of the the last remaining particle in the particle physics zoo of the standard model. And so this is saying, okay, we really do have a, a good understanding of how particle physics works in the electromagnetic uh, quantum or uh, strong and weak nuclear forces. We have a good understanding of how all that works. So right. it's big news. I mean, this is Nobel Prize worthy stuff. Oh, okay. And I'm sure right. there'll be a Nobel Prize out of it at some point in time. Okay. So they've been going at this for how long now? Well, the LHC has been running for right around three years. In fact, I remember writing a TNRTB about three years ago. It was posted in September of 2009. Uh, you know, the LHC is having all these troubles. Are they going to run? Yeah, they just had the issue where uh, one of their magnets had uh, failed and uh, it had directed the beam into the edge and it spilled a whole bunch of liquid helium throughout the tunnel. And people were saying, oh, this is a waste of money. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't. And I kind of wrote saying, you know, hey, this is just standard standard startup problems for a big mm -hmm. experiment. Give it time, and I expect within the next three years we're going to have a, a detection of the Higgs boson. And so here we are, three uh, here years we are, later. three years later, wow. and then lo and behold, it happens. Hey, so, you want to go to Vegas with me? Uh, <laughs> I would not bet on my predictions that regularly. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the large hadron Actually, the one bet I can guarantee is that if you don't go to Vegas, you won't lose money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Spoken like a scientist. Um, the Large Hadron Collider, then, just for a little more background for lay people, this is underground then, and how, how long is this? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going to get the number wrong off the top of my head, but I think it's, uh, it's a number of miles around. I want to okay. say 17, but that may have been the superconducting super collider that was supposed to have been built in Texas. But, you know, it's a very large – the the larger the circle, the higher energies you can get because as you bend a particle in a around a curve, it actually radiates energy away. And so you want to build big particle accelerators. All right. So and so it's, it's, uh, it's just – it's a long tunnel, like I said, miles long. Yeah. Um, and it has the, these these very large magnets, right? As I think you've described yeah. It's got it these two uh, tubes that they circulate the particles in, and then they've got magnets that bend the particles into the right trajectory so they stay inside the tubes. And they've got uh, for the LHC, they actually have super super conducting magnets, so because you can get a lot more, they get more power, stronger magnetic fields out of these magnets, and so you can bend things into a tighter radius and. Um, you know, it's it's a really you know, it's a state of the art machine. Uh, there are physicists who spend a lot of time figuring out how to design and build machines that work like this. And so, you accelerate particles to you know within po or ninety nine point nine 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 percent the speed of light. Uh, so they have enormous energies, wow. and then you collide them together and look at the look at the debris. Okay, um, so they have collided these particles together, but that's been done a while back, right? Oh, well, we do, they, they have analysis. been doing stuff like this for a long time. They've been doing for the LHC in its current energy configuration or its current current uh, configuration. They've been taking data since 2011. 
Um, so they've got data from 2011, 2012, and they've had uh, you know something on the order of a quadrillion collisions, or a, or a thousand trillion, or a million billion, depending on how you like to say it. But a lot of collisions, and then they sift through all of these collisions, looking for the signature of a Higgs boson production and then decay. And there are different kinds of ways that the Higgs boson can be produced and decay. And you know, you look through all of these, and you look for. Uh, enough of these events, and and the problem in any sort of experiment like this is not so much that you can find events that look like a Higgs boson. It's it's of finding enough events that aren't mimicked by background events. There's a background, and so uh, you know you got to find enough events that look like a signal above a background expectation. And so that's you know it's it's maximizing your signal, minimizing your uh, background. And so there are kind of specific decay channels they look for because the signal is expected to be higher compared to the background. Okay, All and right. so they've they've looked for numerous. You know, there's four or five different channels that they look in to see. Uh, or decay channels to see, do we have evidence for a Higgs boson? Uh, you mentioned earlier that this would help to fill out this standard model of physics. What are we talking about? This is particle physics, right? So Correct. Breaking down, breaking down like for lay people, we can think of uh, protons, electrons, and neutrons. We're talking even more fundamental particles uh, than that? Well, yes and no. You actually listed off some fundamental particles and some not fundamental particles oh, okay. there. And so when, when you're dealing with the standard model of particle physics, uh, specifically what you're interested in are the, the quantum forces, if you will, electromagnetism, uh, strong nuclear interactions, and the weak nuclear interactions. Those are, those are uh, theories that we've developed that are, have a quanta, or they're fundamentally quantum theories in nature. And so each of these interactions is mediated – uh, by particles, which are bosons, and they act on different kinds of particles, which are not bosons, and so uh, or, or not not necessarily bosons, and uh, typically they're fermions. And so, when you're talking of fundamental particles, you listed off the electron. There are actually three particles, kind of like the electron, that have a different mass. There's the electron, there's the muon, and the tauon. And then each of those three particles has a corresponding neutrino. So there's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tauon neutrino. So those are fundamental particles. Um, then there are uh, – you talked about the protons and the neutrons. Those are actually made – or comprised of more fundamental particles. They're made up of quarks. And so you have, again, six quarks, three families of them. You have the up and the down quark, and those make up the neutrons and the protons. Um, or protons and neutrons are made of up and down quarks. And then you have the uh, charm and strange quark and the top and the bottom quark. All right. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, naming conventions aside, you know, yeah, there's just cool. <laughs> there are these six different quarks that we have. And they are all of the, you know, the protons and the neutrons and all of the, the, the what we term as hadrons. Um, and then there are the particles that mediate the forces. So there's the photon. That's a massless particle. That's effectively that's light. Um, and then there are some other bosons that mediate the weak nuclear force, which are the W and Z bosons. There are some bosons that mediate the or the strong nuclear force, which is the things that hold hold uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and those are gluons. Um, and we've detected all of those particles. So I, I, you know, that's right around sixteen to eighteen particles because there's six of the leptons, the electron, muon, and tauon, and its neutrinos. There's six quarks. Uh, which makes twelve. There's the the proton or the photon, and then there's the four uh, bosons: the W or the excuse me, the, the photon, the Ws, and the Z. There's those four bosons, and then there's the gluons. The one outstanding question in all of that is: you say, all right, th- using all of these particles, we can explain how the electroweak or the electromagnetic force operates, how the weak nuclear force operates, how the strong nuclear force operates, even how they might be unified with one another. Um, the problem, specifically when you're looking at how the electromagnetic and the weak nuclear force might be the same force in the same umbrella, is you can say, all right, we can build models that explain that, and the standard model will do that, but it predicts that all of those bosons are massless. Well, the photon's still massless, but the W and the Z bosons aren't. All right. So you've got to say, all right, well, why do they have, why do we have this mass asymmetry? Well, if there's 
Uh, there are ways to produce massive particles if you have symmetry being broken and a Higgs field that pervades space. And so in, what it amounts to is that each of these particles, as it moves through space, it interacts with this Higgs field more strongly. And the more strongly it interacts, the more mass it has. And so the photon interacts very weakly. The W and the Z interact much more strongly, and so they have a lot more mass. In fact, it gives us a mechanism for explaining the masses of particles. Well, if that's all true, then there's got to be this Higgs boson because the Higgs field actually interacts with itself and produces these bosons. The and Higgs so, field has been known, but the well, boson not? Or? If the Higgs field is the proper explanation for why the photon has no mass and the W and oh, Z I bosons see. have mass, there's got to be a Higgs field, then there needs to be a Higgs boson. Okay. And so that's why they were searching for this. In finding this, it completes the particle zoo. So we've detected all the... The, the electron, muon, and tauon, and the neutrinos. We've detected all the quarks. We've detected uh, the photons. We've detected the W and Z bosons. We've uh, been able to detect or, or characterize the gluons, but this Higgs boson was the one unknown component. And so we've been able to actually measure it. So it, <laughs> it, it completes the, sta the, particle, the, the standard model of particle physics, the zoo of particles there. Now, uh -huh. That's with one caveat. We've detected, or what uh, the scientists at CERN and the uh, ATLAS and CMS experiments have detected is a particle that is a boson in the range where we expect to find th that it looks like a Higgs so far, but they have not done all of the tests to make sure, yes, this is the standard model Higgs boson. I thought you said it was to a five sigma result. Well, they've detected, there is, uh, the five sigma result says we've d they've definitely detected a particle. It's a boson. And to the extent we've measured it, it looks like a Higgs boson. Now, we've actually, they've got to go through and do all the careful tests and make sure, does it match the kind of boson that the standard model requires? And in fact, this is what may sound a little counterintuitive, but there are a lot of scientists who are saying, yeah, we're glad we found it. We hope it doesn't quite match the Higgs boson that we expect from the standard model. Wait a minute. Why would they say that? Well, you think, okay, well, isn't this a nice tight theory? We've got it all explained. Well, there's a couple of things that we don't have explained when we look at the universe as a whole. We don't know what the dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. We can't incorporate gravity into this standard model of particle physics because of some fundamental or, uh, fundamental uh, differences between the gravitational theories we have and the uh, particle theories we have for the other three forces. And so what that says is there's got to be other models out there, more complete models that can incorporate all of this. Well, if the the Higgs mo the Higgs boson is exactly the standard model Higgs. Then it says, all right, well, this doesn't give any give us any cl clue as to how to find this more uh, complete theory or more inclusive theory that incorporates all of that. Well, mm -hmm. if it's not a standard model Higgs, it may say, all right, well, maybe these supersymmetric models are correct. Well, those supersymmetric models naturally have dark matter candidates built into them. And so it might it by not finding exactly the standard model Higgs, it would actually give us a clue to the more broad theory that's going to help us incorporate some of these other things that we don't have a good explanation for yet. All right. So the further analysis is going to yield whether this is the Higgs-like boson or the actual Higgs yeah, boson. Yeah, I mean, it could be one Higgs. It could actually be multiple Higgs that all are similar in mass, and so we just can't resolve them yet. It, you know, these are just questions that we don't know yet. But it'll help us constrain and hopefully give us insight into what that more complete theory is. Okay, a little bit of background again for people who might be new to this podcast or reasons to believe. Uh, why is it called the uh, Higgs boson and why the God particle? Well, it's called the Higgs boson because the person who came up with the mechanism for explaining why the photon could be massless and these other bosons could be massive was a fellow named Peter Higgs. And so he was the idea that came, or the the person who developed the formalism that showed how that could work. And so this Higgs field, it's named after him, and the field coupling to itself is the Higgs boson. It's the particle of this field that couples to itself. So it's just historically the person who uh, kind of developed this uh, mechanism for explaining the masses. Um, why it's called the God particle? There are numerous explanations or numerous reasons. It really dates back to a book written by Leon Letterman, a uh, particle physicist, Nobel laureate, talking about the Higgs boson, and the title of the book was called The God Particle. 
Um, and there are some kind of tongue in cheek reasons why, what it was and whether the editors changed the name from what he wanted, but kind of the, there, there's an implication of it's this Higgs field that imparts mass to particles. And so it's kind of got this godlike property, if you will. Yeah, like the um, holy grail of physics. Or something, something like that, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no real, you know, by, de- by detecting this, we're measuring God. I mean, that's yeah. not at all what's going on. It's really a, a hyperbolic or a statement Ooh. of hyperbole that it's a God particle. It's yeah. really just the last particle that we hadn't found that we're, we're, we're pretty convinced was out there. All right. Um, f- this is from uh, Lawrence Krauss, who— not exactly sympathetic to the idea that God exists. Right. Um, part of his quote here is, uh, far from suggesting any higher power, the discovery at CERN takes particle physics one step further toward answering the question, why is there something rather than nothing, by demonstrating the plausibility of the idea that everything we see could arise naturally from an, init- an initial state of no particles and maybe no space and maybe even no fixed laws without supernatural shenanigans. All right, what do you make of that uh, quote? Well, I mean, we've addressed uh, Lawrence Krauss's uh, views quite a bit. I think in other Science News Flash podcasts, and I know there's uh, Hughes written a response, and there's another uh, uh, apologist uh, RTB, or with RTB training who is uh, developing, a, you know, kind of talking about Lawrence Krauss's and even Stephen Hawking's idea that uh, even though the universe may have had a beginning, that it doesn't require anything beyond the universe, that it's kind of self-existent, if you will. Um, I, I think there are some fundamental philosophical problems with that. Uh, but basically what you're, what you're saying is that given the laws of physics, we expect universes to happen. And so in some sense, they're just saying, all right, the brute reality is that there are these laws of physics or things that cause things to behave a certain way. Um, that that's the brute reality. Well, I would say in some sense that's a minimal characteristic for God. Um, you know, and, and the, I would say the, the, the naturalist who's trying to explain everything apart from God will say, well, now you've got to explain why the laws of physics exist. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's, it's uh, there, I think that's a little bit, to, to get into a more complete uh, response to that, I think uh, is, is more than this podcast. Uh, it'd, make a, it'd make for a long podcast, but I think, I will make the or make these two statements that one I think there are philosophical problems in his argument that th- something can arise from nothing, um, and even at that, it's predicated on the ex- idea that there are these laws of physics that operate independent of any other sort of other existence. So you're they're still positing a self existent uh, or a self existent brute reality, if you will. In fact, I think Krauss in his book acknowledges that. Uh, he can't separate his view from some sort of deism, if if you will. But I think what he's getting at is uh, a response to, I think, Christians who have argued that, well, we don't understand this, therefore God's there, or or arguing from our gaps in our understanding that this is where God's involved, or we can't explain this, so therefore it's God. And what he's saying is, there, this is one area where it looked like there was a gap in our knowledge and people might have posited God there. And where they've done that, this has showed how that was a bad thing to do, that we've now explained how this particular aspect can work. And so it's a, I agree with Krauss's assessment that where we're arguing from God from a lack of knowledge or a, or a gaps in our knowledge, that that's a, that's a bad idea and that's a place where God will be increasingly relegated to the dustbin because our knowledge of how this universe is going to continue to grow. Because I think that's what God's equipped us to do, is to understand this universe in more and more detail. Yeah. So. Uh, Jeff, here's a question I got from uh, Facebook I think would be helpful. Uh, the Higgs boson particle or God particle is claiming basically that a particle was created as a result of their experimental explosions. I find this interesting because modern-day evolutionists believe that matter and energy have always existed and cannot be created. The first law of thermodynamics says that matter energy cannot be created or destroyed. So my question is, does this new discovery contradict the modern-day evolutionist theory that matter cannot be created? Um, no, it doesn't contradict it in any sort of fashion. Um, one, and, and I guess I would uh, kind of challenge the assumption that modern-day evolutionists assume or or believe that matter and energy have always existed because I, I the evolutionists of which I'm aware all accept big bang cosmology which says the universe began to exist so 
Um, they just argue that given the conditions here on earth, that there's a mechanism for generating life from non-life, and that once that life is here on earth, that there are mechanisms for uh, generating the diversity of life we see here that doesn't require the intervention of a god. So it's uh, independent of the thermodynamics and the creation of matter and energy, uh, an evolutionist generally accepts, as far as I know, kind of Big Bang cosmology, which has, you know, that there's the universe began to exist and that there is a finite amount of time in this universe and specifically here on Earth where all these processes can be in operation. So I, I would challenge that assumption. But generally, they're trying to see how can these things happen without need of a divine intervention. All right. Okay. Uh, give a bit of a wrap up and where do you think it's going to go from here? Well, I, I don't know exactly where it's going to go. I know what they're going to be doing now is saying, all right, we know the energy or we know the mass of the Higgs boson. We know it exists. Now we can tailor our experiments more specifically to try and measure the properties of the Higgs boson. And that's going to be quite a, that's going to be a, a substantial effort too. It's, uh, you know, there's right now essentially only one detector in the world that can produce, or one instrument in the world that can produce the Higgs boson in a sufficient quantities that we can study it. And so whether that requires a, a future particle accelerator that's devoted to that or, or what, I, I'm not entirely sure. But they're going to spend a lot of effort trying to understand, you know, okay, so it's a boson. What, uh, you know, w let's nail down its mass. What other quantum uh, numbers does it have? What sort of properties does it have? Does it match the particle that the standard model of, or the particle predicted by the standard model of particle physics. Um, and they're going to continue to push on that. My hope is, I actually hope that it shows itself to not be the standard model Higgs boson, that there's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be similar, but that there are going to be clues in those differences that tell us how to build that more complete theory. Um, I also expect that the more we understand and study that there's going to be, uh, it's going to continue to uh, bring up new areas of fine tuning of which we were just unaware. Right. Now we know it's mass. Now we know this, and we ask the question: Given what we know now, how much does our universe look the way we expect it to look, or does it look unusual? Does it look fine tuned, uh, given what the the parameters are that we we understand now from this Higgs boson? And so that that how that's going to look, I don't know. It's hard to predict, but I expect that we're going to see that as time goes on. All right, so as, as far as implications from a supernatural perspective then, has RTB incorporated this as part of the creation model we have here? Is that, is that kind of Well, I would say at? it's incorporated in the sense that uh, you know, it, it includes kind of the general standard model of particle physics, okay. you know, that there's uh, fermions and bosons and there's leptons and quarks, and you know, th so that that's – Part of our model, I, don't, I wouldn't say – I wouldn't by any stretch say that, oh, well, we've made this prediction of the Higgs boson is going to look like this or – you know, it's part of our model because that seems to be what – the prevail or you know that's where the evidence lies in the particle physics community is that there's going to be a Higgs boson and it's going to look something like this. So, yeah, I can't by motivate from scripture. Oh yeah, we're going to find a Higgs boson and it's going to look like this. It's one of those details that is really it fits within our model that uh, and where it impacts or touches pl base with our model is that. Our model says that where we find things like this that are foundational in how the universe operates, that we expect to find them fine-tuned or designed for life to be here. And so that's where I expect we're going to see the interaction with RTB's creation model specifically. Okay, good. Uh, by the way, how many people work on this project? The, the Hadron Collider is in Europe, but it's an international effort, is it not? Uh, I, I you have any idea? I'm going to say it's got to be in the thousands. Thousands, okay. Um, I don't. I couldn't put a specific number on it. I know, uh, you know, if I go back about ten years ago, where large, uh, you know, where a single detector or people that are working on a single detector are putting out results, that those papers had, you know, typically had four or five hundred names on them, mm. you know, and so the scale of the experiments have grown, the number of experiments in an accelerator ring has grown, and so. Uh, it's got to be in the thousands, but so I could. Who, who will get the Nobel Prize? <laughs> generally, the the leader of the project. So you know, even just One going person? back. Uh, well, look at the Kobe experiment uh, mm -hmm. that was discovered the ripples in the cosmic micro background radiation. That in, there in were nineteen nineties. Right? Yeah, that was uh, early nineteen nineties. Okay. There were people who built that. There were people who designed that. There was a team of probably I'm guessing somewhere between ten and a hundred people. 
Um, but yet the 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 pro- or the principal investigator the the person who's in charge of the project is the one who gets the Nobel Prize. Same thing with the okay. the dark energy discovery. Uh, uh, I think it was the Nobel Prize last year. It was Saul Perlmutter who was the head of one of the observing programs. You know, so there were a bunch of people working on it, but he was the one that got the prize because he's the one who's oh, okay. leading the project. I thought so. there were three people that got well, it. There were. There were two different projects. So uh-huh. Saul Perlmutter was the leader or the head of one of them, uh, and I'm going to miss one of the names I know is Adam Reese and a third fellow who I'm just drawing a blank on. Um, there were these two different uh, observational programs that were, you know, the high Z. Uh, High Z project and the Supernova Cosmology project. Pearl Mutter was the Supernova Cosmology project. Um, Reese and the other fellow who I'm drawing a blank on his name worked with the High Z uh, project. And so the the kind of the the fact that two different projects saw the same results confirmed it. But it was the two projects and the leader of the two projects. So that, that's okay. that's why it was divided yeah. that way. And yeah. so, you know, and, and I would mention in this one thing that's in, as as a confirmation in the, that we've actually found the Higgs is that there were two separate detectors in the LHC that actually both individually found a a particle that looks like the Higgs boson at the same energy. Uh-huh. And so it's kind of there's a lot of checks and balances already built into this preliminary uh, uh, discovery announcement. So okay. I, it's pretty convinced that it's there. It's just the question is, what does the Higgs look like now? All right, sounds good. Uh, unless you have anything else, how about a joke or two? Right? Because there's been a lot of humor. Um, you know, I, I, I just thought it was funny. I was uh, just kind of looking at, uh, you know, Higgs boson news, and I ran across this uh, article, Three Ways the Higgs boson discovery will impact financial services. Yeah. <laughs> It's <laughs> the one that I thought was amusing. It says the Higgs boson is or the Higgs discovery is obviously a huge validation for CERN and the LHC, but it's an even bigger triumph for those who like to smash things together in the hopes that something good will come out of it. While results of tests at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo, Wachovia, and NASDAQ OMX have been mixed, the CERN discovery will embolden cause to just keep chucking financial groups together and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Uh, there's also a, a new beer, a Boson de Higgs beer. Uh, this beer gives weight to the other beers. How about that? <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole slew there's of a, uh, Yeah, I found a tweet from Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, very well known. Uh, very is he prom- an astrophysicist. He's an astrophysicist. Yeah, prominent um, skeptic. People so. have seen him on TV for sure. Here's his tweet: The Higgs discovery makes me feel heavier already. <laughs> what we need instead is the anti Higgs, a particle that takes mass away. <laughs> and then uh, one last uh, joke here that I found from uh, Brian Mallow, science comedian: The Higgs boson walks into a church. The priest says, "We don't allow Higgs bosons in here." The Higgs boson says. Uh, I'm sorry, the Higgs boson says back, but without me, how can you have mass? So there you go. <laughs> there you go. It's, uh, it's a particularly a Catholic of, version yeah, of, a, yeah. of church service. There's a lot of humor <laughs> out there, but uh, okay, well, great stuff. Glad you came. Well, and it is. It, you know, it's an important discovery, and uh, it's just neat to see stuff that in my scientific career that things that have, have become prominent right when I was kind of in graduate school and that's when the the W and Z bosons were discovered was right before I started college and seeing how now you know almost 30 years later uh, we're coming to fruition of measuring the Higgs boson that explains why they have the masses they do so it's it's kind of it's an exciting exciting era for uh, for physics these days okay very good all right that wraps it up for this edition of science news flash is there anything we want people to Read if they want to delve further into this. You've written on this, obviously. You referred to a Today's New Reason to Believe article. Yeah, I would just look at the the Today's New Reason archives and just the the discoveries that we're making. Uh, you know, not only about the dark energy, but of the Higgs boson and other things that uh, you know, just planetary finds, ideas that there might be a multiverse. Just to look at the breadth of what's being discovered in science today, and just really appreciate this incredible world in which we live. Okay, sounds good. Uh, that book that you mentioned, the booklet, Who's Afraid of the Multiverse, by Jeff Swearing, is available here at reasons.org. And also, I think you mentioned earlier that Hugh Ross responded to Lawrence Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing. He wrote, I think, two articles uh, on today's new reason to believe in response to that. So people can I think that's right, check yeah. out our archives. Uh, Hugh Ross is the author of those two articles. All right. If you don't have our uh, free mobile app, download that so you don't miss any of these podcasts. For Jeff Swearing, this is Joe Aguirre thanking you for listening. 
God Pod. This podcast is made possible through the generous gifts of the friends of Reasons to Believe. For more information on how you can support this podcast, go to reasons.org slash donate or call 1-800-482-7836. Thank you.